Right there in the center of your screen, John Blackrobe, and you call him the man, he's just a stud on the basketball court. Right, looking forward to seeing him tonight. He's averaging 28 points a game. He's the leading scorer in Bergen County right now, which is something to say. He's a 2,000-point career scorer, and uh, he got that against Mawa back on February 13th. He can shoot the three, he can drive the he's a full package. He's been recruited to go and play at Seton Hall next year, so this is the real deal. Winning did. That's the only thing that I cared about. And Pascac Valley wins the North Lawn Group 3 Championship at the San County Tech in Wayne. The number five seed had a great celebration. We'll have you with us, Joel Kanye, Chris Arnold won their section. Yes. Black Rope. Yeah. Black Rope again to Black Rope. Pulls up the jump. Basketball is just kind of a way of life. I think it can teach you a lot about life, you know, whether it's dealing with adversity and we're dealing with success. Um, I mean, it means everything to me. I was introduced to the game of basketball at a very early age. Um, my uncle, my dad's high school coach, was the coach at um, Hasbrook Heights. And we would go down there as early as when I was two years old and get to play on the court. And um, my dad and him kind of taught me all the early fundamentals of the game. Um, those are some good memories because I enjoyed going down there and. Uh, you know, messing around. I was probably on every court in Bergen County by the time I was eight years old. The person that had the biggest impact on me was my dad. Um, he was a star athlete in, at Pagoda High School, star basketball player, baseball player, um, and he taught me the, the basic fundamentals on how to be successful in basketball, but then he also showed me mentally, you know, how to win, how to accept losing, you know, how to be the person that I was in through within basketball? My father impacted my, my brother and I because he was a positive guy. There wasn't, I see, I see parents today, everything is pushing their kids. It, it wasn't the case. People thought that, that was the perception, but it wasn't the case. My father didn't put, push us to do anything. It was all positive reinforcement. If, if we wanted to play, my dad was all for it. You know, um, but yeah, it, it, it was always a positive thing. He was truthful to me. That's really important, especially today, because people don't necessarily hear the truth when they should, especially young kids. He, he would say, if we had a bad game, he said, you stunk. You weren't very good, but there's another game and that's all that matters. There's one more game to be played. And, that, and that's the most important thing. But yeah, he, he, he was just, it, it was always positive. It was always positive. Growing up, John's parents had a huge impact on him in sports and in life in general. You can also imagine growing up with an athletic younger brother led to some competition in the driveway. Growing up with a brother, it, well, it was competitive, but I was the older one, so I think it was a little bit worse for Mike. Huge impact um, to this day. You know, four and a half year difference. We, we know how good of an athlete John was, so he drove me tremendously. You know, I, I thought if I, could, if I could beat him, I could really, I could beat anybody. He had a lot to deal with in terms of, I'd kind of beat him up. You know, he was, he's four years younger than me, and we would play everything together. But I, I would have never had it any other way. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think we taught each other things that we didn't really understand at that, at that age, but you know, we, we competed in everything, football, baseball, basketball, roller hockey. Um, we, we did everything together. You know, I, I wasn't as good, but my strive to be better was because of him. I always wanted to be a little bit better um, and try to just get to his level. Even if I was short, I'm striving, I'm striving to be there as much as I could. So it, the work ethic was created because of John. I mean, that was the, that was the biggest thing until this day, it's helped me with my business, you know? That, that's, 
that's number one to me, work ethic, and it was because of John. You know. Do you have any stories growing up with your brother involving sports? <laughs> um, growing up, though, there was so many times where we ended up going to the, the hospital because he kicked me into the wall. You know, Mike and I were so competitive. Um, I mean, I love the kid. You know, he's, he's my best friend. And, but we were, we were not nice to one another growing up. I had my head uh, gushing blood because he kicked me into the wall. He, t he pulled both of my, tooth, my uh, front teeth out because I had a fake cigar in my mouth. I was laying on the bed. He pulled the, f the fake cigar out of my mouth. One time, <laughs> we used to play football outside and we put all the pads on and everything. So we, we get all the pads on and we go outside and I tried to hit him so hard, and I'm four years older. Well, I hit him so hard <laughs> that that was it. Like, he's crying, my mom's yelling at us, so it's, it took us 45 minutes to put all this stuff on. Within a minute, we were back inside getting yelled at, and I was in trouble, and he was, he was hurting, so. He took a gun one time, a fake gun, tossed it across the, the, the outside on the field, hit me in the head, head was bleeding, you know, we're like six, seven years old. Head was bleeding, so it, it was things like that. While John and his brother were messing around growing up, he was also beginning to work on mastering his basketball skill set. My work ethic was I would get to Holdrum early, middle school. Um, the, the coach was friendly with my dad, so I'd get there before school and I'd shoot, and then when school ended, I'd play at lunch, and when school ended, I'd play till it was dark. You know, I'd be outside working on different things that I saw guys like Michael Jordan or guys who are prevalent in the NBA uh, work on different moves. But I was at it every single day. I mean, I probably spent four to six hours every day playing. You know, coming up with whatever drills I could think of, making shots. And then as I got older, I understood how to work out. And, you know, I would shoot. I, I would get to a point where I would have to make 15 or 20 in a row from every spot. If you get to 19, you know, I'd start over again. And I think that, that kind of instilled a discipline in me to work, but not, not get down if something doesn't go my way to just keep pushing forward. And if you do that and you work hard, good things happen. John's work ethic was, was different in the sense of I always thought it was interesting, as a young kid growing up, you have a big brother that you look up to. He wasn't the kid, he was a popular kid, I think because he was athletic, but he wasn't the kid that was partying. You know, like, I would hear from his friends, he wasn't the kid that was drinking alcohol on the weekends. He'd go to parties, show his face, but a lot of times those nights ended by going to the court. Like in Hillsdale specifically, Memorial Court, he would end his night going and shooting with his friend. He was just getting 500 shots up, and he's got jeans on, and he's got a polo shirt on, and he's just getting shots. And this was not uncommon. Like this was just part of his part of his life. John was an extremely hard worker from the very beginning. His strong work ethic growing up led him to averaging 40 points per game for Holdridge Middle School. After his success in middle school, it was time for him to grow as a person and as a player when he decided to go to Pascack Valley High School. The, I knew some of the guys at Pascack Valley when, when I got there. Um, the, the best thing about going to Pascack Valley was the coach I had, Coach Underdunk. I mean, my, my father knew him when he was a kid because him and my dad, his dad and my dad were friends. Ironically, I, I, you know, I knew he was a very good basketball player, right, in seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. but. Um, in a really weird way, when his father, um, in his younger years, played softball on a softball team with my father, right? So how weird is that? So that, my father and his father were good friends and they played softball together. So I was the bat boy when I was like six, seven, eight years old uh, for that team. So I knew John's father already, right? So then lo and behold, fast forward, John's like in seventh grade, and um, in seventh grade, I saw him, and in eighth grade, I saw him play, and uh, 
that's kind of when I first met him. I knew a lot about him. I, the, the program wasn't, didn't really have much success in the past. They hadn't won, I don't think, many county games and they hadn't won any state sectionals. So, you know, for me, that was attractive because I wanted to go to some place where, you know, I, I could help start something new, you know, start a new tradition with with Coach Underdog. It didn't, didn't go as smoothly early on, but it, it worked out. Um, he came in as a freshman, and um, that was my fourth year. I had had the two prior years to that. We had very good years. So um, his freshman year, we only had two or three seniors. We were very young. So um, he was clearly, clearly much better than a lot of the a lot of the other sophomores and juniors, so um, it was not a tough decision. Playing varsity my freshman year was great. Um, there wasn't a lot of people that did it, so it was an accomplishment. Um, the, the strength was probably a little bit of a factor, but the basketball aspect wasn't, wasn't a problem. I had, I had no problem, in my mind, competing against anybody, you know, in any of the teams that we played. Going into your freshman year, you don't really expect much. I never expected him to play as start as a freshman. And then he has all this success as a freshman, and all of a sudden, all right, now, right, like, we expect a lot. <laughs> the relationship that I had with Coach Underdunk, to today, he's one of my best friends. Um, we talk all the time. Uh, in fact, we're playing golf tomorrow, but it, it didn't, go very well early on. What was it like to coach John and how is he different than other players I ever coached? Well, uh, it was a hell of a challenge, honestly. When I tried to transfer, I didn't think he was very nice to me at times. And I was, I was a baby and he was right, but I didn't understand that then. When you have a player of his caliber and you know it when he's coming into the high school, um, I had the mindset of, you know, uh, I was very, very, very hard on him his freshman, sophomore year, because I knew of the capabilities and the ability that he had. So um, I, I, and he'll probably tell you the same thing. I rode him really hard. Uh, in fact, after his freshman year, he wanted to quit. <laughs> he wanted to transfer to Bogota, where his father went to high school. But and. Once I got to my junior year, or late in my sophomore year, I realized, you know, he knows what he's talking about. He's teaching me how to be a player he thinks that I'm capable of being, and in, in, in turn, basically taught me how to win, you know, at a higher level, like playing on the varsity level. So, um, it was rocky at first, and he'll tell you the same thing. I'm sure he'll use different adjectives, but, um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It's not an easy thing to coach a, a top flight caliber player like that because you know there there's a lot of there's a lot of attention on him. There's there's resentment on the team, right? All that stuff. You know, you're catering to the superstar. So um, it was a hell of a challenge, but uh, I'm sure he would say the same thing that it was it was well worth it, and it turned out turned out really well. Keith was a was, was a great great guy, um, great coach. Um, you know, I went to uh, I went to Bogota. I uh, I played uh, varsity there uh, my freshman and sophomore year, and they have a great coach there in Jay Mahoney. Um, Keith had a completely different personality than than Coach Mahoney, um, but both of them were guys that were passionate about basketball and they believed in playing hard all the time, playing defense and playing tough. Yeah, playing for Coach Underdunk was, it was a great experience for me. I, I say the biggest thing is, he definitely taught me how to win, what it takes to win. And although they had different personalities, um, one thing that I noticed about Keith, and that goes into your question about, you know, was, was he harder on John? If you look at all the great coaches, Jay Mahoney, Keith Underdunk, um, there's, a, there's a list of everybody, but um, they are always harder and they expect more from their better players. And 
that's what I think makes it great Cokes. They recognize the players that should be held to a higher standard and they ride them more than those that you know are not at that same level and I think that's that's done to motivate them and you know as a, as a good coach um, I think it's important to have your better players be the ones that are held to a higher standard um, and you know Keith was definitely somebody that did that he did that with John um, when I played there he did it with me and several of the other guys on my team that were the better players uh, he expected more from us and he certainly expected a lot from John being you know the basketball player that John was how did you grow as a player throughout your entire four years of high school I got smarter I got smarter um, I learned how to play the game at, at the high school level uh, it wasn't it wasn't easy in the beginning because we weren't very we weren't very good but I think the, the biggest growth happened between my, soft, my freshman and sophomore year. You know, I went from averaging 16 points a game or, or whatever it was to, you know, 29. John's attitude and leadership uh, from freshman year to senior year. So, yeah, he's, you know, he comes in as a, as a freshman and, um, you know, the heir apparent superstar. And as I said, I rode him pretty hard to knock him down a little bit. But he was, he was, a, he was a good... He was a good teammate, you know, freshman, sophomore year. Um, and then, you know, his junior year, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our first two years, we were not very good. But his junior year, um, we were still pretty young, only a couple seniors, and he was, he was a junior with a couple of juniors. So that's when he kind of grabbed kind of that leadership role his junior year. And I started to learn how to be more of a leader on the floor and, and – and win, you know. I, we were we were terrible my sophomore year, and then you know we got guys that had developed a little bit. Who you know really at Pascag Valley nobody's really considered a basketball player. I mean, the, it's not it's not really known for their basketball players, you know. So we had a lot of guys that were football, baseball players, and they had just were athletic enough and got better. So by the time my junior and senior year came along, we were much better. You know, he was a good leader. He worked, he worked hard in practice, right? Um, he would get the other guys, you know, to play hard, practice hard. In terms of me, I think that gap between my freshman and sophomore year was huge. And then I became a better defender. You know, I wasn't, I didn't really want to play defense much in my freshman year, but by the time I was a senior, I was guarding the best player on the other team. How did John act? What was his demeanor like as a high school athlete, as a high school basketball yeah. player? Um, as good as you can be under that, that type of stress as a young kid. So, for example, he'd be getting ch chanted SAT score. <laughs> Black Rove sucks. I remember them chanting uh, and laughing SATs and things like that, and um, he didn't react. And there was never, never an instance where he reacted to the crowd, ever. Why? Because it was spoken about. That's something that my father would talk about. He says, you don't react to them. You don't hear them. That was spoken about. And he handled it incredibly well, because people would come up to him and say, how do you do that? You know, like, we're not talking about thousands of people here. We're talking about, at most, a thousand in a game, uh, a couple hundred people. But when you're in a small gym, you hear everything. And it, at a young age, 16, 17, 18 years old, being able to handle that and thriving in those situations, it's tough to do. His demeanor was incredible that way. There was a lot of attention around him. Um, and all of our games were usually pretty crowded and uh, there was always guys on other teams that were gunning for them and fans would really fuel those other teams and they would go after John and boom and to my knowledge based on you know those games that we played in it never really seemed to bother John at all when it came to fans booing him or other teams being a little bit aggressive towards him because of the reputation that he had. Obviously John was the focal point of Pascac Valley's team. 
Other schools tried to stop him and slow him by having a player whose sole job was to guard John. Let's just say that didn't really work out for them. The Black Rose Stopper for Pascal Kills. You know, I don't, I, re I remember Pascal Kills, I remember Ramapo, Bergen Catholic. Um, there were several teams that always had a player that was specifically designed to defend John, either in a box in one style uh, format or in a triangle in two style. Um, I don't remember specifically the, um, those, those players, but I do know that when we used to have games where there was a player that was calling John out, whether it was through friends that knew people in town or other students in the school, um, John would always elevate his game because he would take offense to the fact that someone's basically saying they could shut him down. And usually in those games, uh, John would probably score 30, 40 points uh, without blinking. And that was just, you know, that was just a testament to John's competitiveness that, you know, he wanted to be the best player out there and he would take offense to someone that would call him out saying that they could stop him. And um, usually that wasn't the case. Pascal Kills my senior year had a, had a kid that they called the Black Rope Stopper. And I took offense to that. Like, you, who, you know, who are you? You've never, I've never heard of you. And so we, we played Pascal Kills the first, first time we're playing them and I end up getting sliced open. I head butted somebody. So now I, I, I hit the game tying shot with 20 seconds left and then some kid hits a shot over somebody to win the game. So now I have this game the second time we're playing Hills is on my mind. So before the game, you know, you go out to center court and you, you pound, you give everybody a pound. I walked, I walked over to this kid and I said, listen, you better, sh you better tie your shoes tight because I'm going to show you something you've never seen before in your life. And I had 44, I think, that night. It was just like me can, can, talking, talking trash to him as a kid saying I was the black rope stopper and you can't score on me, John. Um, let's just say this, he had 40. I mean, that, that sums it up. And then a, a kid at Fairlawn High School, it was like the TV game of the week or whatever TV station they were putting it on in, in, um, in Bergen County. And uh, kid yelled out from the stands, hey, Black Rove, if you're, if you're so good, get 40. At 45, I walked over to the kid on the sideline. I said, is that enough? And there was like, there was a whole other quarter to play and Fairlawn High School didn't even score 45 points that night. So I, I, I shut him up and outscored the other team. That was pretty funny. I don't, um, I'm trying to remember some of those years that there was a stopper and uh, evidently he didn't do a really good job, <laughs> I guess, because I don't, I have no idea who, who that would be, honestly. <laughs> John's demeanor and maturity on the court throughout his four years led to high standards and success on the court and plenty of accolades in Pascack Valley and the state of New Jersey. I thought the Gatorade Player of the Year thing was, was a joke. I thought it was, somebody was joking around about it. And, and I actually got the letter in the mail. I got home from school. I got the letter in the mail and I called Gatorade. And I asked them if they had made a mistake because I, I, there, I didn't expect it. You know, I think I had gotten Player of the Year in Bergen County, and that was cool. But to be recognized as player, the best player in the state at that time, and to get that, that was that was different. That was that was a really cool feeling. And the cool thing is, I think I'm still the only one in Bergen County, so that's that's pretty cool. I was his biggest fan. Yeah. People know, like my close friends, like I talk about it. It was not easy growing up, your brother is maybe the best player in the state, Gatorade player of the year, and you have to follow that? You know, it was pretty special seeing John uh, score his 2,000 point, I believe it was actually a Mawa. Coach Underdunk, the night I scored 2,000 points, said to everybody, he, he'll tell you the story, but he, he told every, whoever gets, whoever gets John his 2,000 point gets $20, and $20 at that point was like a lot of money, you know, to us.
So that was a special moment because, you know, there's, there's only a handful of people in the history of Bergen County to score 2,000 points uh, in a career. And, you know, John was able to do that, and I was able to be a part of that and witness that, which was pretty special. What was John's demeanor or attitude about achieving milestones such as, like, 2,000 points, get your play of the year? And did he ever bring up the fact that he was close to getting 2,000 points? Yeah. We didn't talk about that stuff. I'm telling you, like, it, he talked about trying to win, you know, and he, it, oh, and, and that probably again stems from my father. It was always about trying to win. Um, we didn't talk about a thousand points. Obviously, when it, when something's approaching like that, like that milestone, it comes up, but that, that was not something that he wanted, to, that wasn't on the top of his list, put it that way. We won the game. You know, like that, that's, I never, I never thought about scoring, like what, pe what, what people don't understand is, and I don't mean to sound arrogant, but scoring was easy. It wasn't, it wasn't hard for me. I mean, but I, I worked, you know, the thing that I, the only thing I cared about was what the, what the scoreboard said at the end of the game. Do we win or do we lose? Because if they didn't put a scoreboard up there, we could just go out and have fun, you know, so. The 2,000 point thing was a much bigger deal to everybody else than it was for me. It was definitely about winning, but I think that's more so, you know, just being around my father and how he brought us up. You know, it was about the team and you were going to try to do, especially if you had the talent and the skill, you were going to try to do anything that you could for your team to win that night. And that's how I think John played, you know, and I think that's how most of the best players play within their team sport. You try to do anything you can to win. It's eight points a quarter to score 32 points a game. And I scored, what, 29. So it was, it was easy. And, I don't, and again, I don't mean to sound, you know, I think, listen, uh, no, no, if I had more help, I probably wouldn't have had to score as much. That's how, I mean, that's how I look at it. I had a lot more help my senior year when Mike Layton got there. Uh, so what I knew about the basketball program was that they had a player called John Blackgrove on their team. Um, when I was a junior, going into my junior year, John was going to be a senior. So I knew for the last three years, John was you know the leading scorer in Bergen County. Um, they weren't a very good basketball team in terms of their reputation, but you know John was the basically main person or, you know, the thing that stood out the most to me about Pascag Valley basketball was, you know, they had this kid named John Blackrow playing for them. Mike was the best teammate I had from a basketball sense. You know, Pascag Valley is not a, a school that you is really known for its, you know, boys basketball players coming out of there. And when Mike transferred from Bogota, it was the best thing that could have happened to us because it was, you know, he fit my style. You know, he could, he could kind of, play off of me. We played really well together. From the moment that I went to Pascag Valley, John and I became very close friends. Um, we were both very passionate about basketball and um, I think our styles really without a doubt complemented each other and I think it showed as our season progressed um, that year. And we played very well off of each other. I mean he, he had size, you know, he had length defensively and we kind of had a knack for each other and where each other would be. So. You know, I think he was certainly the best teammate that I had from a basketball sense at, at Valley. He was, he was a great teammate. Um, he, he wanted to win more than anything. Um, you know, he was passionate about uh, the game of basketball and he wanted everyone to be at the same level that he was at when we went into every game. So as a teammate, I think he pushed a lot of us to, you know, be our best. Do I believe I was a missing piece to John winning his state title? <laughs> I, I don't want to say yes in the sense that to take away anything from the other players, um, but um, I think I was a I was a good compliment for John coming in. One person can't do it, you know. So you, you know, in high school, you need two or three guys that can play, um, that work well with one another in order to have success. And I think he certainly was the piece to that puzzle. But we had also had our center go down and break his ankle in gym, you know two months prior to that and when he went down we were we were in trouble but we went and played a little bit smaller and it ended up working out 
you know, the three years uh, that John had, um, he didn't have very good teams. I think his junior year, his team was okay, um, but not to the level where uh, we were as um, as um, when he was a, when he was a senior and I was a junior. We had some great players uh, that year. You had Matt Goodman and Dave Hasman and Lou Byerly and Pierce Delisle. Um, and we had a really good core group of guys. I mean, no question about it, John was the guy that led us. Um, you know, every team was double and triple teaming him every game. And, um, you know, as the season progressed, John really started taking that weight off of his shoulders. He already had scored a two over 2,000 points uh, in his career. And we started really gelling as a team. It dawned on me that the school had never won a state sectional championship and I, I really didn't realize that until I looked up at the banner and saw that there's nothing there. So um, to answer your question, to, to, to get into that position, to win a state sectional and it's the first in the history of the school, um, I can't, you can't, and I think we were the fifth seed, right? So my God, it was, um, it was an unbelievable feeling, and it's, it's something that, quite honestly, when we did it, I said, well, we're never going to do this again. This is impossible because, you know, the school started in 1955 and we're in 2001. So it's, you know, there's a lot of basketball players that never did that. So, um, but just really an unbelievable accomplishment um, and really one that I cherish to this day is one of the highlights of my life, honestly. Winning that state sectional was the ultimate because we, everybody picked us to lose. Um, it was the first one. And I think, I think more than anybody, I think, you know, Coach Underdog deserved that. You know, he deserved to get that because he he's such a good coach, but he never got treated fairly, I don't think, um, in terms of being coach of the year or um, dealing with parents, you know, he, he deserved that because he, he gave us the chance to win that. Um, we had had issues early on in the year and um, he got us all together and he made that happen. That wasn't, that wasn't me, that was his, his ability to manage us and put us all in a position to be successful. Yeah, winning the state championship, that feeling was, was incredible. For me, it was my first state championship that I had ever won. Um, you know, there was a lot of emotions there because, you know, that season, especially in the beginning of the year, was a little bit of like a roller coaster year for us. Um, we, uh, we had lost a couple games that we should have won in the beginning of the season. Um, like I said, John was, um, John in the beginning of the year was really trying to get used to not having to be the, the Put that, put that weight on his shoulders every game. They, there was other players on that court that could contribute. Um, not to say that John didn't have to contribute because he certainly did and he was the reason why we were as successful as we were. But I think it took a little bit of time for John to get used to it. For three years, he was the sole focus of that team. He was the one that was doing the primary, the scoring. And it wasn't until that season really started to develop where John started kind of giving that role to other players and we started gelling as a team. So for us as a team, the emotion to be able to win that state championship the way we did under the circumstances was, was unbelievable. And then winning a state uh, sectional like that was really pretty special. I mean, I still remember it was 20 years ago. What was the PV program like once John graduated? <laughs> the expectation was high, right? So. 2000, 2001, they win their first championship in the history of the school. You know, all these good teams you hear about, you see these guys on the board. The girls program has a great, great program, great history. But you find out that they never won anything, right? So John just wins the first championship with his team. They did a great job, had a great run. We're coming in and the juniors that played with John are now seniors, right? And they're supposed to be really good. And they lose, they don't even get to the sectional championship and they were talented. So I was a senior, we had, um, we had two, we had, uh, two um, 
two returning um, starters, myself, uh, Lou Byer, sorry, three, my, uh, myself, Lou Byerly, and Rob Delaney. And um, we were primarily a senior team. The program, I think going into the season, because John had graduated, I don't know if within the county or the league we were really recognized as a, as a good team. I think they thought we would be an okay team. And we really had a great, uh, a great senior year. John evolved a lot during his time at Pascac Valley, but possibly the most beneficial experience he got was when he was invited to the ABCD camp. ABCD camp was, was a dream that I had from when I was you know, a younger kid when I, when I knew what it was. And one of my AAU coaches at the time had taken me over there to see it. So I went over there and um, watched with him. And then a year later, I think I was a freshman in high school. And a year, two years later, I get this, this mail, this thing in the mail, it's like this big package in a, in a tube that you would send pictures in, you know? And I opened it and it was an invitation from Adidas to go to ABCD camp and I couldn't believe it, you know, cause people, you know, typically around here, it, 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 then it didn't happen. You know, there wasn't many guys that were from Bergen County that were in the camp. I don't think there was any. Um, so obviously I said yes and I got to the camp and my roommate was Charlie Villanueva. Uh, Eddie Curry was there, Lenny Cook, LeBron, Carmelo Anthony, uh, Sebastian Telfair. I mean, there's so many of them, I can't, I, um, I can't remember all of them. But um, it was an incredible experience. Kobe came to speak to us, so we got to spend time with Kobe, and um, it, was, it was amazing. It was, it was the first real basketball experience I had ever had where you were playing against the best every day. And that was something that I always wanted. And I think the first three or four days, I was the number one ranked shooting guard in the, in the camp. Um, then I found out I didn't make the all-star team because I wasn't on an Adidas AAU team and I wasn't very happy. So I didn't shoot the ball well that, the rest of that, that day. But we won the championship in that league, in, that, in the camp. Um, Got to meet a lot of good guys, got to meet a lot of good coaches, great coaches. So that was, that was fun. Anybody who's a competitor um, and wants to win, the only way you can accomplish that is to do it against the best, if, if you want to be considered one of the best. So to have the opportunity to play against the best and, and do well and have success, was, that was like a dream come true. ABCD camp was a small taste of what basketball at the next level would look like. After a very successful four years of high school basketball, he was highly scouted by many different colleges. My sophomore year, uh, Freddie Hill from Seton Hall showed up at the gym after a game and, and started talking to me. And I, I didn't really know who Freddie Hill was at that time. Um, and I didn't really know anything about being recruited to play in college because I just, I was happy I was in high school, you know, playing varsity. Next thing you know, I'm being recruited by Seton Hall. Um, so that's where it, really where it all began. My sophomore year, Freddie Hill and Tommy Amaker were recruiting me to play there. You know, listen, I, to be honest, there wasn't a lot to do. They started coming, right? And as I said, um, Fred Hill from Seton Hall, he was an assistant coach at Seton Hall. After John's sophomore year, they got to him early and he, you know, John, he really kind of signed right away and he just so it was a good thing because then he didn't have to worry about it and um, at the time Tommy Amaker was coaching at Seton Hall and then in, after John's senior year Amaker left to go to Michigan and that blew everything up uh, and then you know John went to a prep school and then he uh, wound up at Fordham with Bob Hill. I thought he was uh an awfully intelligent player. You know, he had, he had marvelous instincts to play basketball. He had, uh, you know, he had to score a lot of points for them to win. Uh, it's not that he took every shot because he tried to make his teammates better and he got them involved when he could. Um, but he thought the game really well. Um, and uh, he was a team player. Lo you know, he just loved basketball. I mean, he just, he just was passionate about it. And, 
and because of that, it was fun to uh, it was fun to watch. One night, I don't know where it was. I was over. Uh, it was close to the GW Bridge on the Jersey side, and uh, he he played okay in the first half. They were winning, and they came out to halftime, and I and I just watched him the whole halftime. He didn't miss any shots. <laughs> he made every shot when he was warming up, <laughs> and they ended up winning the game. Um, so you know, he was fun to watch. Really fun. Me choosing Fordham, the only reason I chose Fordham was Bob Hill. There was no other reason. Probably him and his son, Cameron, who I'm still to this day close with. Um, that's, those are the only two reasons. I didn't, I didn't choose Fordham because of it was a great academic institution, which it is, but I, was, I picked it because of the coach. You know, to be really honest with you, I think my NBA background had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, and, and my passion and curiosity for basketball because he loved talking basketball and uh, he always wanted to get better. So he, he felt that because of the players that I had coached before going to Fordham that, um, you know, I could, I could improve him. I could really help him get better and, and reach his goals. So I, I, think, th I think that's probably true as, as much as anything. Uh, but I had a good relationship with him. I mean, we hit it off. Bob Hill's impact on me was when I got to Fordham and I started sitting in, in his office watching basketball, watching tape and film, I knew then that that's what I, I wanted to do. Like I, I wasn't, if once my career ended, I was gonna still be in basketball. I wasn't gonna get out of it. I was gonna coach. So. He was just an, an unbelievable mentor. Um, he wasn't a yeller and a screamer. He was a, a teacher of you know life uh, and basketball. John broke the Fordham freshman record for threes. You know, he, he had a great run to the end of his freshman year, where he scored tw I think 25 out of six games. Yeah, five out of six games. I mean, it's just hard to do in Atlantic 10. So, and then he comes in. He's, he's averaging almost 15 a game as a sophomore in those first 10 games. And then the 10th game, he gets hurt, and he had 30 in that game. You know, he had some really good games, um, but he had to get, you know, when, when the natural progression for players, you play in high school, uh, and then you go to college, and the game's quicker. The game's quicker, the game's faster, the game's played above the rim. Um, you know, the players that you guard are quicker. It was definitely a shock. You know, first practice, I got beat up. I didn't. I couldn't get a shot off. It was. It was. It was hard. You know. And then you just. You. You once you get used to it, and you're eight, and you're good enough to play at that level, then it's. Then. Then you're fine. There's a big difference there. So, learning to adjust to the speed, the quickness, the, the physical, uh, the physicality of the game, and all of that was, for for, for all freshmen, it is a big big adjustment. And. Um, you know, that's what he had to go through. What made you decide to transfer? <laughs> Fordham, Fordham fired Bob Hill. Um, I, I fully expected to be running to find Coach Hill and give him a hug after we won the Atlantic 10 championship, the way I, Coach Underdunk and I hugged when we won the state sectional championship, which had never been done before. And I felt like Coach Hill had put so much faith in me to help turn around the program at Fordham. And I felt like Fordham didn't give us a chance to do that, which we would have done. Um, but I felt cheated, you know, so I stayed one more year and it just wasn't for so, me. You know, I always felt bad for John because I couldn't get I couldn't get that over the hump. And uh, you know, and then when he decided to transfer, I didn't blame him. You know, I, I didn't blame him. I was gone. I was the reason he was there. And uh, I felt like if everything went okay, he'd be a good player at Fairleigh Dickinson. And maybe if he if he could get his feet back on the ground and gain some strength, maybe that goal that I had for him going overseas and playing might still be there for him. Take us through that Western Kentucky game. The Western Kentucky game. It's 
It's like all the air is let out of the balloon type of thing. It's devastating, right? Because of the great high school career that he had. With seven or eight minutes to go, I think I, I didn't shoot the ball anymore the rest of the game, but I, had, I think I had, I don't even, I had 30 points or something like that. And they had a kid on their team who was the only guy in a long time that had broken a backboard in college. 24-23, Winchester dribbles down to the free throw line, hit it slapped away, loose, picked up by Western. Dixon will get a two-handed slam dunk, and he just shattered the backboard. He just shattered the backboard. He came and set a back, back screen on me. And uh, you can't hear a lot of times the, the talk if it's not loud enough, because the gyms are loud, because there's so many people. And I didn't hear the back screen getting called. And I ran square into this guy who was seven feet, like 390. I just didn't see him. And I ended up with a protruding disc in my back, in my neck. The next, the next day, I couldn't move. I mean, I, was, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. So they, they shut me down for that season, and that was it. I played 10 games my sophomore year, and that was it. After that injury, you start to see that maybe he's not as motivated anymore. He's really frustrated. The coach gets fired. And it's just like a snowball effect, and it's just not there. It's not the same. It's not, the, I don't think, the love anymore. Uh, the injury really affected his athleticism. Um, he had, you know, injured his back pretty bad, um, which was a tragedy because, you know, that game John was playing really well, and he really seemed to be coming into his own that sophomore year as a player. Um, he was doing really well, and, um, you know, unfortunately, that's, 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 that's sports. You know, you're going to get injured in these competitive games like this. And, uh, you know, and I called him and talked to him about it. And that's the one thing that I, you know, I just always was fearful that, that he was going to get hurt. You know, but to his credit, it's just another test, right? It's like, all right, so I'll deal with this. And I'll, uh, I'll deal with it and I'll, I'll get better and I'll, uh, I'll keep playing. So, um, yeah, it's just, that was a, that's a sad thing, you know, when that happens. And then the Achilles was just like the final, the final straw, right? And I just, I was never the same player after that. But I think that's when there was a, there was a big turn in the sense of a, a lack of motivation. I don't know if he would confirm that, but I saw that. And... Again, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't around all the rehab and everything, but when he got to FTU, there was a different, different level of focus. Right out here, I was, had my friends with me trying to get in shape, and my Achilles popped. So that wasn't, that wasn't fun. Yeah, I knew, I knew right away. I mean, this is not that, this is what, I was a sophomore, gonna be a sophomore. It might have been going into, so it's 05 or 06, right? And he makes a hard move, and he goes down, and. I knew right away. I want to say that I was actually there for that too. Um, I, 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 I don't know, I think John may have tore his Achilles once or twice, um, but I remember playing at Mark Lane pickup games and you know John just you know stepped wrong and um, he went to the ground and uh, he had tore his Achilles and I, I want to say that was, yeah, I, I was there. I think he was at FDU at the time. Um, so I was there for that, which is, and again, you know, just, you know, as you get older, as you're playing, I mean, your body just unfortunately sometimes, uh, you know, not, not that it shuts down, but, um, you know, you get a little bit more prone to getting injured. And, you know, that was the case with John, um, you know, basically throughout college. However, you know, it's the same John. Like, I was guarding him. Now, what do you think happens? He goes down, he looks behind him. He thinks somebody threw a rock at him. That's what he says. Like, who threw the rock at me? And then he's, you know, pretty much cursing me off. Like, it's my fault. <laughs> like I didn't do anything I'm just trying to guard you and but there was like people watching people coming over the ambulance is coming they you know of course John the antics <laughs> the ambulance comes onto the grass they're putting him on a stretcher you know he's got a time like John just get up and walk it off you know even though I knew it was a bad it, it was a tough injury I mean he totally ruptured his Achilles tendon and it rolled up into his gas drop you know so it's, it's a significant injury it doesn't exactly feel great after that. I talked to the doctor before the surgery and I said, look, can you just get me back, you know, in, in January or February? This was in September, I think. I was like, just get me back in January or February 
for, so I can get in shape and make a run at the playoffs. And he kind of looked at me and after the surgery was done, I had said that before the surgery, and after the surgery is done, he said, look, you're, you're not going to be able to play again like you, like you thought or you think you can. He said, your, your Achilles shredded like a rope. That's one, if you don't do your rehab, you're done. Um, and so I was devastated, you know, because I've been around that injury a lot. And, uh, you know, he, he, had, he had had the back injury and now he's got an Achilles injury. And, you know, I was fearful that this may put an end to the whole thing. Um, so sick to my stomach, you know, um, concerned for him because, because of his love for the game of basketball. I don't think there's a question about it. He wasn't the same player. He wasn't the same player after his back injury, you know, and I don't think he had the same motivation either anymore. I think there was different things that uh, motivate him at that point of his, his life and career. I think the Bob Hill getting fired was a big part of that. That really let him down. He loved Bob Hill, you know, I mean, that was his guy. Bob Hill taught him so much. He got into coaching because of Bob Hill. You know, so when he got fired, that was a, that was tough. That was really tough. I mean, and then the injuries were just added, added to that. It was just a snowball effect. But he, yeah, it, it was a different player. There's no doubt. Like, like, how hard was that to just like step away from the game of basketball, like playing wise? Awful. I mean, to when something comes to an end you know, unexpectedly when, you know, you're not prepared for it, that's, that's hard to deal with. And then when it's something that you love, like the way that I feel about the game of basketball, you know, that's, that's one of the worst hits you can take. I mean, obviously there's more important things in life than basketball, but you know, as a kid, when you're playing, you don't, you don't think about that. So everything, for me at that point was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't good. You know, there were no more, there was not going to be any more arenas. There wasn't going to be any more packed gyms, no more playing against the best. So that was, that was, that was tough. How do I think John was able to let go of basketball? I, playing it at least? I don't think he does. That's why we're here. I, I don't think he does let go of it. I think it's a struggle. But I think that's a big problem for a lot of people that were successful in a sport or therefore anything, you know, and then it's taken from you and you can't do it anymore. I mean, we see it with professional athletes all the time. Um, but yeah, it, I think he's at least in the game. I coached for the first time as a, right after my senior year of high school for, my high, for Coach Underdunk in a fall league. I coached the, the boys fall league team. Um, and then I did it more often once I got to FDU and I was hurt. And that was, I loved it. And then when I graduated from FDU, I ended up getting the University of New Haven associate head coaching position. So that was cool because right out the gate from playing, I, I now had a full-time job coaching basketball, which it was D2, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was great to deal with kids and players. John is a coach. It's interesting. John didn't have a lot of, he didn't show a lot of emotion on the basketball court as a player. As a coach, you know better than anybody. John had a lot of antics. He has a lot of antics. He's got a lot, he's going after the referees. He's getting after the players. Um, but I also think it depends on the level of basketball. I think when he's dealing with younger guys, it's, he's a little bit more maybe harsh. But he doesn't coach like that when he's coaching with older guys, college kids, and he t it's more of a teaching approach, and um, he's more open to hearing players out and whatnot. But he gets after those young guys, you know. How is being on the sideline different from being on the board? <laughs> well, most of the time right now when I'm on the sideline, um, I'm kind of thinking if I was playing this game, we'd be winning. <laughs> John, John is, John's special. John is a special coach, let me tell you. Like, he, he will get the most out of you no matter what, no matter what circumstance, no matter where you are, who, who's playing. It could, be, it could be the last guy off the bench of the worst team in America, and he will make sure they get, go out there and kick the other team's butt. He's, he's one of the most intelligent people when it comes to basketball I've ever been around. 
you know, you listen to John, he's going to put you in a position to win and succeed. Um, but when it comes to like practices and games, like he's just going to do what it takes to win. So you just listen to him, you'll be in a position to win and, uh, you know, succeed as a basketball player. Uh, he's tough for sure, definitely a tough coach, but he knows what he's talking about. So I learned at a young age, like sort of just listen to him because he knew it was best for us. and. He honestly taught me so much like growing up. Uh, John teaches the game of basketball like really simple, really fundamental. Um, he can give you the most complicated play, but within like three minutes, you'll understand what's going on, like who's supposed to be doing what, what you're supposed to be doing at every position. And it's just, he just simplifies the game down to like the bone, really. He teaches you stuff that he knows will work. So like, kind of like ingrains in your like head early on. Like if you listen to him, like you'll get like a good result every time. You know, I think for me, in when I think about it, it's it's I'm fortunate that I'm in a position where I can pay forward all the things that people have taught me. Um, I've been very blessed in the people that I've been able to learn from and be around. So to be able to help kids and teach kids and make them better players and, and better people better young people that's I'm in a very fortunate position because they they'll listen you know based on my experiences so I can kind of help kids be better and I think anytime you can do something like that with anybody that's a blessing all right so come in here with a disciplined mindset that you're gonna get yourselves better and work on something before we start practice make sense you gonna smile today you in a good mood today how about you? I tell you all the time, just get yourself ready to practice. Yeah. With all the talent you have, you gotta get yourself ready to practice, get ready to get shots up. Come in here, get to the front of the rim and work. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why people insist on this age shooting threes. Everybody wants to shoot threes. If we could just get kids to make layups and mid-range jumpers at this age, it would be great. Ready to work? Just listen, don't get frustrated. Just focus on your footwork, especially when we do the stuff next. Focus on, you know, getting the footwork down. Don't worry about making shots yet. Worry about footwork, right? She's coming to screen for you. You're coming off, don't let her turn the corner. You have to fight over and get back in front. Now stop. I want you to work on driving the ball today too. I want you to work, when we play, I want you to work on taking the ball to the basket and creating and be a little bit more selfish, okay? Because you're too nice sometimes. Trying to throw passes instead of shoot and be aggressive and drive it. That's what I want you to do today. Take it up top. Grace, no volleyball. Go from two hands. That's a lollipop pass. Go! And same with you. You got to be more aggressive. If you have open shots, shoot it. Don't worry about missing. Just think about making. Does that make sense? Do I have any regrets? Not winning more. I mean, we won the first championship at Pascag Valley. I, I would have liked to have, I, I'd, I'd give back all the points for four of those. Points never mean anything to me. Winning did. That's the only thing that I cared about. So when it, when it comes to Winning, I'd, I'd rather give all the awards back and have four, four championships. Because at the end of the day, when you lose, you know, and someone else wins, you're a first loser. You know, and I, I, I have issues with losing. Winning is the, winning is the ultimate. One word to describe John. <sighs> Driven. Um, when I when I think of John, he was he was he was always driven to be the best at whatever he did, whether it was on the basketball court, on the golf course, or as a coach, or as you know trying to develop players' uh, basketball skills as a trainer. And um, I would say John John one word was driven. Passionate for what he does. I know like he was passionate as a player. He always wanted to be the best one out there on the court. And as a coach, I think he still feels that same way. He still has that edge to him where he wants to just, he, he just wants to be known as the guy who could walk in the gym and before before you even play, the other team just doesn't want to play you, even as a coach. And I'm sure he was like that as a player too. Definitely intense. Uh, he, wants to, he wants to win more than anyone. 
He's going to do what he can, to, what it takes to win. Um, you know, so if if you're if he if he feels like you're doing something wrong, he's going to let you know. Because at the end of the day, he wants you to succeed as a player and for you to contribute to the team so you so you can win. Uh, just tough, like tough minded, tough mentally, like uh, and. Uh, but it's a good kind of tough, you know, you kind of need that growing up. You need like discipline and like order to kind of keep you in, like keep you in line. You know, because when you're playing basketball at an age early on, you're kind of just like running around free, trying to get all the energy out and he kind of keeps you in line, but it's, it's good for you like in the end, you're growing up. So he's a, definitely a great teacher, great mentor and I uh, appreciate him a lot. You know, he was curious. He was uh, curious about how to get better and curious about the NBA and curious about the stories that I could tell him and you know he just was always wanting to get better like that I have a picture of him he and I walking off the court after a game and he's asking me questions you know I mean so he was always I, I think that's the best that's the best word that he was he was curious and he wanted to get uh, you know he wanted to be good he really did competitive I just want to win that's it. Glad you're with us, Joel Kanye, Chris Armstrong. Wow. John Blackwell from downtown in the corner. A three-pointer, his first three of the night. Yeah, it just gets worse for Sparta. They're down now 18. Right, and you know, he scores 28 a game. He only had four in the first half. You know he's looking for points. So they've got to do a very good job on him again. The tenacious defense again by Pat. Oh, Byerly, Byerly. Yeah. it out. Black row. His second three-pointer of the night. Second here in the third quarter. And Pascac Valley up 20. North one, group three, sectional finals earlier tonight in the same gym. We had it in our last broadcast. Sparta girls won their section. Is he red hot now or what? Yep, he's looking, looking for the shot. He's going to get it. Definitely going to work for the points in the second half. And, and second half and, and they are off quickly getting good shots and seven down sorry Chris seven straight points from Black Row to start the third quarter on a 7-0 run got to get a hand in the face every time chip away at his two points at a time but it all starts with defense Joe it's the first trip to Pascal Valley here in the sectional final since 1979 three-pointer by Lake.